Hey guys, Diana here from Garden Love. So today I am at the Silmar High School Agricultural Center where Steve Liss um, puts an event together every single year where he has some guest speakers and he raffles off tons of trees. As you can see, all the trees that I'm walking through, they're all gonna be raffled off and all the money's going to a good cause to his program so he can continue to teach kids about agriculture and do the amazing job that he does here at the center um it's just amazing i wish all of you guys could be here but i know you guys can and for that reason i'm recording as much as i can so i can share that with you guys i hope that you guys find this information uh valuable there's some composting classes that we took we took uh some classes on grafting with dave nelson from um la um burning nursery he was amazing i am so excited to share that information with you guys and uh, uh so you guys can learn from it and a lot of people asked some great questions that i'm sure you guys would have as well and he gave some great answers so i'm, I'm really really excited to share that like um but i'm gonna walk through here and show you guys what's going on and hopefully you guys stay tuned to some of the classes the videos might be a little long but they i can guarantee you they are so informative that you would not regret watching every second of that video um and i'm sure you guys will benefit from it okay so let's go take a look and see what's going on over here you know we have a lot of good knowledgeable people out here and uh, we kind of work together on something like that. But anyhow, I know we're kind of pushing things, and we want to hear all the information from Dan, but first I want to introduce my friend Charles. Charles paints your trees different colors. I don't know why, but he's going to tell you. Come on, Charles. Thanks. Anyhow, give it up for Charles. Yes, ma'am, hold on. Paxton, all the way up to Paxton. What time? 9 to 11, so uh, to get there like 8.45. Otherwise, you have to walk up the hill because the parking is horrible. So, anyhow, Charles, go ahead and do right there. Oh, we got a professional photographer here. And. You know, we've got. Uh, hey, did you introduce me to her? Yeah. You knew her before I did. Yes, I did, for many years. <laughs> um, so, Diane with Garden Love. Again, thank you, Steve. Um, this is my number one favorite CRFG event of the year, hopefully. Um, Nothing negative to the other events for the year. There's so much talent. We're so lucky to have Dan um, with the Laverne Nursery here and all of that skill that he's bringing to us. Um, Steve List and all the other professionals that are here. The generous donations and the thousands of dollars that he's giving away following this lecture. Um, it's mind blowing how much money is being given um, just for your enthusiasm um, in plant and tree care. Um, my name again is Charles Malfi, I'm a biologist plant expert with Ivory Organics and um, I, this is now my third year here and I'm proud to share that our Ivory Organics YouTube channel is now a leading garden product YouTube channel ahead of pretty much every other garden product that's out there. Um, I'll just mention miracle Grow, but all of the other garden products you see there, we've just exceeded 47,000 YouTube subscribers thanks to you guys um, in your views, we average about five to 10,000 daily views on our YouTube channel, learning from over 200 educational lessons. Um, as Steve said, painting trees is one thing we do. You can fertilize, you can mulch, you can do everything right, but if your tree is burning, in the summer we're dealing with summer sunburn, um, and I've got a peach tree next to um, where I've got a booth with, you can see sunburn damage, a few of you guys visited me. I've got an open can of product for those of you that pick up a tree. You can paint your trees on the way out. It's all organic. It's registered material for use in organic agriculture. Colors white, brown, and green. And we also have fertilizers um, known as six macros. Um, how many macronutrients do plants need? Any guesses? I just kind of said it. It's six. Everybody knows NPK, but it's also magnesium, sulfur, and calcium. Plants have six macronutrients. This is the only fertilizer you'll find on the market that has all six macronutrients in one product. So um, check us out after the meeting and um, just want to thank you all for your support and um, and also your brochures that you have. This I'm sharing with you guys and I don't give it away. Um, my cell phone number is on the back as well. So you can call me, text me, email me um, and I'm here to help you guys with making this your best growing season ever. Thank you all. The floor is yours, Dan. I've been with you uh, rare fruit growers for a while and um, I appreciate all the knowledge in this room. Each and every one of you brings something to this to this organization and every time I'm here I learn something 
Today I learned from Charles that we've got an organic uh, fertilizer that has actually got some uh, kick to it. You know, it's a, what, 13, 13, 10 or something. Now we've got some um, alternatives to <laughs> conventionally growing fruit trees. So um, take advantage of it and, and talk to them about buying some of those products. Um, Steve, Tony, and Jim in the past, all of you guys, we appreciate everything you guys do for us. So. Um, I was asked to speak today and Steve came up to me earlier and said, so what are you, you going to talk about? I'm just going to go out and start talking and hopefully people will pay attention. I talked to Tony a little bit. He said, um, some of you haven't been out to the nursery. I, I work for Laverne Nursery and have for um, almost 20 years now. And he said it's kind of cool to talk about how you start a tree because people in this room are interested in starting their own tree from a seed. Um, I'll, so I'll kind of go over the uh, avocado process for us. I've got a grower in, um, I've got a couple of growers in Fillmore that use uh, Zutanos as uh, pollinators for Haas avocados. We all know that we need pollinators for our avocados. Is that right, everybody here? There's A-type flowers and B-type flowers. They're hermaphrodites. They switch from A to B during the temperature change during the day. So if you have a B-type flower, which is a Zutano, and to pollinate a Haas avocado, which is an A-type flower, you're gonna get more fruit. Typically in the backyard, in most of your backyards, you don't have to worry about that because your neighbors are gonna have some avocados. And <laughs> there's enough in California that you don't have to have two different types in your backyard. Now, would Laverne Nursery like to sell you two different types? I think that's great. So go out and buy a couple of different ones and put them in your backyard, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> So with those growers I mentioned in Fillmore, what I do is um, I have them pick the fruit. In, um, usually in November or December, I have them pick their Zutanos. There's not a big market for Zutanos as far as selling them in a store or fresh fruit packing. So they just, the groves have them for their pollinators. I buy the um, fruit from him, he brings it in, and we have probably anywhere from 90, 80 to 90 bins, and we've seen picking bins, how big they are, of avocados sitting in the nursery during this month, and we just watch them rot. Mm -hmm. And the smell, you will not want to eat guacamole for at least <laughs> a couple of it's just, it, It's everything I can do during Super Bowl to have a chip and some guacamole <laughs> because I've had that smell you know, stuck in my head. But, so, we, so we let them get very soft, actually to the point where they rot, and we squeeze the seed out. So we've got these buckets, I mean end loader buckets full of bad guacamole. We get rid of that. So we take the seed, we clean it up, we wash it with a, um, with a uh, fungicide to make sure that, that it's nice and clean. Then we plant it in these small little tree pots. They're about two and a half by two and a half by uh, six inches deep. The people that have been out to the nursery have seen these. Um, then we wait for them to grow up. And that takes probably about two months. March. So it, between two and three months. As a matter of fact, right now at the nursery we're grafting. So we've, we've got this, this little tree, it's about this big, maybe half the size of a pencil. We cut the top of it off and we take the wood from our mother trees that are in the, uh, in the nursery. We, we go out and we cut cyan wood off from those, process it, and then we cleft graft those um, right onto the rootstock. Um, in about 30 days after that, you can go back to the, the tree that you've grafted and just touch the petioles of the, of the branches that you've cut off. And if they fall off, you know your, your graft is knitted in. Um, after that, if, if it hasn't worked and you, and you want to regraft, just cut it a little lower, go back out and get some wood and try it again. Our professional grafters, I've got grafters that have been with Laverne Nursery for 30 plus years, I, the one guy's been there for 37 years. And they do about a thousand of those a day. So this is a commercial scale operation. I mean, obviously you don't need to do something like that, but what we do is we start with that very young seedling. And the reason we do that is because when you cut that, uh, the top off from that seedling, you'll notice on the inside that there isn't necessarily a, a distinction between the heartwood the cambium layers, you don't have that typical where you would cut a, a, a big tree off and you see the cambium layer, you see the heartwood. This is, the cells are still kind of separating and getting ready, so they really knit in well with your um, cyanwood. They'll, they'll find that cambium layer and grow. 
Um, after that, we take them out of there when they grow probably for another three months inside the greenhouse. I've got a tree that's maybe about this big, three or four sets of leaves on it. I take it outside and put it in a five gallon container. We water it, we take care of it, we put a stake on it. Um, we prune it if it needs it. Um, and then we sell it about six months later. So it gives you some idea of the lifetime of, of an avocado tree. And some of the trees you see out here, obviously certain trees take certain um, extra time or less time, but, it, but an avocado is pretty fast. So questions as I'm going, oh yeah, go ahead. When you plant these seeds, <clears throat> you point side down into the Point side up, point side up. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, if you shave that point just a little bit, take about quarter eighth inch or a quarter inch or uh, an eighth to a quarter inch of the seed off from there it's going to uh, sprout faster for you it'll break open the top of it quicker and shoot your your um your stem up faster the qualities of the uh, chicano uh, rootstock for, for tolerance or uh, what it it seems to do well in southern california soils um, there are definitely different options out there. Our competitor, Brokaw, does a very nice job on selling avocados, mainly to the groves. They don't, they don't sell to retail. But they do a whole different process where they use um, a seedling and then they intergraft on that and then they graft on top of that. So they get rid of the seedling and they use what's called a root rot resistant avocado um, rootstock. Um, it's a long, it's much longer process. That's why they demand so much more for their trees. Typically for a person in, in growing in Southern California in the backyard, you're not gonna worry about root rot. Root rot is more of a, it's more of a water management issue than, than um, a soil issue. Although it does grow in the soil and it's spread by water. Um, I, I can't, uh, uh, emphasize enough on mulch. I was talking to, I've talked to so many people this morning, I was talking to somebody about growing avocados in, in clay soil. Um, <laughs> many, many years ago when I went to school at Cal Poly, there was a gentleman there that was named Greg Partita. Some of you might know or remember him. Anyway, he and I, um, he and uh, I and a few of the other students re, um, regrafted uh, uh, an avocado grove there that was probably 75 or 80 years old, mm -hmm. ridden with um, uh, Phytophthora, root rot. And um, it was all four days at the time because that was what we sold in Southern California before Haas came along. Um, so we went through and we stumped them at about waist high and um, went through and put about a dozen different grafts all the way around the trunk and then mulched it. I, I kid you not, we came in with mulch that was at least two feet deep in this grove covered the entire ground and watch these these um, graphs slowly but surely take off and now even to this day you go back there and you scrape some of that mulch out, out there and you can see that the, the roots have actually come out of the clay um, uh, root rot ridden phytophthora ridden soil and come right up into that uh, that mulch and grow and, and do a very good job so I know Tom has been here before 100 times telling you mulch 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 it's um, even important, even when we don't have um, the drought that we're going through. We've, we've all appreciated the rain that we've had. What are we at, 17, 18 inches? Isn't this wonderful? Um, but the mulch would still help you in your garden. So mulch, um, there's somebody, some people out there saying three by three, three inches away from the trunk, three inches deep around the drip line of your tree. But mulch is very important. I know somebody giving it away. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Cal Poly San Luis Obispo? Uh, I went to no, I went to the right one. I went to Pomona. Oh, you went to the right one. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. I get you guys all the time because I'm up in Ventura County. That's all I get is San Luis Obispo. I was just talking to the girl selling tickets, and she's going to uh, San Luis Obispo too. So, yeah, they got a great, uh, great program going on right now. Did you say that the mulch must not touch the tree mulch? Mm-hmm. Three inches away from the trunk. Okay. So you don't you don't want to you don't want to go right up against the trunk. Although I've seen people do it and it, it, it's okay, but you, you run the risk of running a, a crown rod when you do that. So you don't necessarily want it up tight against the tree. Go go ring around the tree about like that. You got a small tree in the center. Go about like that, and then just as far out as you can go. Mulch is is best. 
uh, growing a fruit tree in the middle of your uh, yard is, yeah, people can do it. The best thing is to have some mulch around instead of the yard, instead of lawn. You, you can control your water better. Um, let's see. So, oh, there's there's something else. I, I, I say it's getting up on my soapbox, and um, we all know that the citrus industry is a multi-billion dollar industry in, Southern, in, in California. Um, anybody that's driven the Central Valley anymore, you see either almonds or a little bit south of that, all you see is orange trees, Valencia's and Washington's. Um, to protect that, you've all heard of unlong Bing disease, or HLB, and also the Asian psyllid. Everybody here has got psyllids. You may even have them crawling on you from being out in the citrus or, or being out in your trees. We've all got the Asian citrus psyllid. What we don't all have is the HLB disease. Um, there's a lot of very good websites. The California Department of Agriculture has got one uh, map that you can pull up. As a matter of fact, we pulled it up this morning. Tony and I were talking. There is an area that starts about the 710 freeway from here into Pasadena down to um, northern Orange County and right now it's right up against the coast of Long Beach. So you can kind of imagine that circle and that's all within the HLB quarantine. So what that means is that the um, disease has been found there. Um, I think we're up to, I don't know, four or five hundred finds in different trees. And there, you, as, a, as a wholesaler, I cannot move citrus into that area. And, and as homeowners, you're not supposed to move citrus out of that area if it's in there. Taking that one step further is no graft wood should be shared. You cannot, uh, Dave, don't give Tony any graft wood. Tony, stop giving graft wood to Jim. You guys cannot. You should not and legally cannot do that. Do not share citrus graft wood because the reason that this got spread was people were sharing graft wood for, with each other. One person had a diseased um, piece of graft wood that we believe came from overseas. He grafted it and grafted a few of his friend's trees with that wood and, and slowly but surely out of the Hacienda Heights area, this, this HLB is spread in Southern California. So to combat that, we have a quarantine zone and we ask that it does not get moved. If you look at the citrus trees I've got out here, there's a yellow label on it and it says those trees have been treated. Do not move them out or in or out of the quarantine zone. So we are in that Asian citrus psyllid zone. We're in that quarantine, we're all in that quarantine, so we're okay. But within the HLB, which is inside of that, we cannot move citrus. So if you're gonna graft, there's, um, there is a way of buying graft wood from uh, certified APHIS structures, which all of the nurseries, like Laverne Nursery, has to have. We buy, the, we, we grow the material in a, enclosed structure that is free of Asian citrus psyllids, therefore free of um, unlong Bing disease. What that requires is 30, every 30-day 30 inspections by the USDA. Um, so we're all, we're all paying for that in, in one way or another, whether it's through the trees or whether it's through our taxes. And um, it just keeps us as producers clean and honest from infecting everybody else's trees. Now, you say, go ahead, you had a question. Is LA County planning to be support this treatment that just put on our trees? I understand the Missouri County will actually fight. Yeah, now you see, when, when it first happened in, in um, Los Angeles County, they were removing trees. I don't know exactly what they're doing about that now. I believe if they have a hot tree, they ask the homeowner to remove it. I don't know if it is required or not. In Ventura County, my understanding is they are yanking it whether you want it or not. Yes, they will trust. Right. So, LA County did, but I think I think the USDA has pulled out of LA County. They've kind of given up on that area, and they and they've expanded their their reach out further, like going southern Orange County and up into Ventura County. Yes. Um, what what he's talking about is they would come. They they. Would, the USDA and through the California Department of Agriculture would set traps up in your citrus trees in your backyard, your front yard, and if they found Asian citrus psyllids, they would let you know at that time, early on, they would treat your tree for you if you would allow them. Then when the HLB came along, then they required you to let them pull it out and then treat beyond that area. Um, 
like I said, I think they pulled out of LA County. They being USDA has pulled out of LA County and they're, they're concentrating their efforts beyond the, out, the perimeter of that. So what, what I'm trying to explain to you is grafting is a lot of fun. It's exciting. It's, it, it's, it, it's a way of getting different trees that you wouldn't normally buy or wouldn't normally see. But with citrus trees, please get a hold of either the UC, uh, UCR system the University of California um, website, you can go on there, you can buy budwood from them, or there's other um, nurseries that are supplying the budwood. Um, Steve, was, Steve and I were talking about, or Jim and I were talking about doing a couple of trees here on campus. I have access to that wood, so I will bring clean budwood and, and graft it for you. Even grafting from one tree to another in your own backyard is not supposed to be done, let alone sharing it with anybody else. Right? That's how it, how paranoid we are of this disease because it will kill your tree. What are the symptoms? It's called greening disease. Um, you know, I had a big uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation I was going to show all you guys. I didn't want to bore you, so I, I just want you to listen to me. Um, it, 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 you know, the symptom of HL, you'll see, okay, so we'll start with Asian citrus. So it, years ago, we were at the, what? what what was the other one? Sepulveda Dam or something where, where we were? We were talking about the meeting that I was at. The other, not Sepulveda Dam. Sepulveda Gardens. And, and remember we were talking, I think it was when Asian citrus silage yeah. first came out. And we went outside and we looked at the citrus trees there and you could see it. Um, the Asian citrus psyllid is about the size of a pencil lead, just the tip of it. It's real small, it's hard to see. But what you will see is this white, squiggly, uh, waxy substance that's basically the excrement from the, from the uh, Asian citrus psyllid. So you'll see that. That doesn't mean that you've got HLB. Now, the, the, uh, they are the transporter of the disease. And the disease, you'll see these long shoots that come out that are a really odd color. And you'll see um, on citrus trees, when you have a disease problem, you'll see it on, on the leaf, will, it'll be the same on either side of the leaf. With greening, you'll have an odd shaped leaf and it'll be a, a yellowish color. And it, it'll, it, it shoots out of the tree very fast. It looks like a uh, sucker or, or rootstock shooting out of the tree, but it's the actual tree. It's the actual, whether it's a Washington or Valencia or whatever, and you'll notice it. Um, that, uh, if you go online and, and just look up uh, greening disease or HLB, that it will, uh, it'll show you exact symptoms of it. A lot of people get excited about it, they think they have it, and normally, most of the time, thank goodness at this point, it's a nu nutritional problem, not, not greening disease. But nutritional, you'll see it on the same on either side of the leaf. With the greening disease, you'll see one side of the leaf is, is odd compared to the other side of the leaf. You'll start getting some very small fruit, very nasty tasting fruit, and very seedy fruit. So you get a normal Washington's about like that, you'll start getting fruit about that size. Is that lemons too? I beg your pardon? Lemons? All citrus. All citrus. All citrus. All citrus. And, and um, there's other hosts other than citrus. I mean, Morea is one of them. Um, the list is getting bigger and bigger. But mainly citrus because we're, we're talking about fruit here. Yes? I heard that I'll spray bigger wines yeah, um, I, well, there's there's some there's a lot of rumors going around about it. Um, when it first came out, there was a guy in Florida. <clears throat> Florida, um, the juice industry in Florida has almost disappeared because of this greening disease. That's that's how important this is to not spread this disease. Um, in Florida, there was a, a grower that put guavas as windrows around his. Um, citrus grove and he wasn't getting it so that was early on they said oh my god what is it? it's it's the answer um the micro micro citrus coming out of florida or coming out of australia doesn't seem to be as um as susceptible to it um i, I tend to think that it's going to end up showing up there anyway i was talking earlier with some people i think the reason we haven't had as big a spread in in california and this is just me as as a guy is I think that it, it prefers a little more humid um, conditions. So we, we're a little drier than say Florida, Georgia, Texas, um, the Texas Gulf states, all that's very humid. And I think that has something to do with spreading it and spreading it a lot easier than, than what's happening in California. 
Um, as far as that being a, a cure-all, I, I don't know. They're, they're working on rootstocks. That's the big place where we're going right now. Um, the problem is with the rootstocks is it's going to have to be genetically modified. And I don't know, in this room, there's probably not a whole lot of people that are going to want it, going to, going to, want to drink orange juice from a genetically modified tree. Um, the, uh, the first genetically modified fruit came out. It was called Arctic apples. You guys may have read about it. They released a few in the Midwest, and the uh, American public didn't like the idea that they had genetically modified fruit. So they kind of have dropped that at this point. Um, I don't, you know, it may be the only way that we get citrus or that we, we um, protect citrus. Right now in Florida, they, they're growing everything indoors. They've got acres and acres of screen house and they're growing these trees inside. Um, that may be the way to go without genetically modifying it. Um, I don't know, we're going to have to see how it goes. What, what happens with citrus. So the rootstock will, a uh, different rootstock will protect <clears throat> they're, they're trying that, yeah. They're, they're working on it. They're, that's one of the ways that they're approaching it. They're, they've also released this tiny little wasp in, in California to try and combat it. That, that's limited. Um, when you have a predator, you have to have prey. And <laughs> if you don't have the prey close enough to the predator, the predator dies. So it's, it's real hard to, to re release an attack. I think is the name of the wasp. But. GMOs, is it short enough for the window where you can explain what and why people sure. are against? Um, Not a big plum. Yeah, yeah. I, my daughter just did uh, a Toastmasters uh, speech on DNA. And I, I, I still keep watching it on my phone. I don't even understand what you're talking about. She's nine. Oh. <laughs> so I can't get into the genetically modified near as much as she can, but I can explain to you that um, the reality of it is we all kind of, all of us people that graft, we're kind of genetically modifying an organism, right? Mm -hmm. We're taking one from one and we're putting it in another. Where people start getting excited is, and I, and I go back to the original genetically modified tomatoes where they took... Um, silk from a spider, the DNA from the silk, and they put it into a tomato plant to protect the tomato to make it a thicker skin so they could ship it. So then they had these genetically modified tomatoes and people had, you know, were worried that their kids were going to grow a third eye or, or whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever was going to happen. Um, genetically modifying something like we do when we graft doesn't seem to bother people. That could happen in, in, in nature by itself. You could have a, a, a lemon tree next to an orange tree they could pleach together and all of a sudden you've got it together and now they've grown together and they become this hybrid of a uh, lemon or, or, or an orange when we graft we we change that we take a lemon we put it on a on a sour orange right we do the same thing what people start getting excited about is when we start crossing um, families when when we take the spider dna and we put it into the fruit or when we take DNA from a different organism and put it in another organism. I think that's where people start getting excited about we're playing God and, and we don't want to do that. We don't feel comfortable doing that. There's, uh, you know, there, there's two different ways of looking at everything. There's one way of saying it, if we genetically modify it, we can make sure it's fresher and we can prevent diseases. If we genetically modify it like we've done corn, people get, you know, there, there is no more non-genetically modified corn very, very rare to find it because Monsanto did it so we can spray it with Roundup and we get bigger corn, we get more corn and we can feed more people. No, we shouldn't have a problem with that. Have you heard uh, their avocado is flowering in, in the home garden and we're trying to get as much food as possible where you can spray a honey water mixture on your trees to attract more bees and have them come and do more pollination and I could see how something like that would work. I have not seen it done. The YouTube video of this guy has <laughs> an amazing sort of pollinating. He just said it attracts the bees and they come back. He's a beekeeper. Mm -hmm. He knows whenever there was honey laying around, the bees would be attracted and clean up the honey. So they put honey around his tree. The bees were just working it for that two month or one month period. Right. He said it's triple quadruple. Wow. Direction. Yeah, I could see that. I, my concern would be almost too much fruit on it. Then, yeah. then I'll, yeah, you'd either have to thin or size pick and, and really watch how, how, how much the, it takes out, out of the tree. Yeah. Plant flowers. 
Do I plant flowers? Plant flowers. I have at least 100. Where if I look out of my garden, I've never had a day when I haven't had bees. Has anybody noticed the the butterflies going by? For what, like two weeks now, right? Um, Painted butterflies are migrating from uh, Mexico to Central California. It had to have been the water or something, the the rain that we've had. There's so many of them. It's just beautiful. Love it. Um, Back to uh, Charles's question. He was interested in. Tropical what kind, of, what kind of uh, new specialties you guys are coming out with, and uh, or do you, are you guys doing any jujubes? I do. I do 15,000 jujubes a year, easy. Um, and, and we do the Lee and the Lang. Um, I buy them from Dave Wilson. <laughs> I pot them up and sell them. Have you drafted um, them yet? I'm sorry? Have you drafted them yet? We have potted them up. They will be hitting the stores in May, and when the very latest. You graft them? I'm sorry. When you graft them? I don't graft. I, I don't know enough about jujubes to speak on it. I don't know when they get grafted. Um, I have done it very limited success in the past. It's there's sometimes you just got to look at what you do, and sometimes it's just easier to buy them in. Persimmons and jujubes, <coughs> me buying them in is just a lot easier for us. I can't I can't seem to get the rootstock up and get the graft to take as easily as I can buy them in. Um, <clears throat> avocado? Yeah, we, on, on occasion, it's, it's one of those avocados that falls in and out of favor. Right now, for some reason, somebody must have been doing some talks about it. I've had a lot of uh, people asking. I probably have done a couple hundred this year. So it will be available hopefully in the, in the summer when you guys do your tour. Um, cherimoyas, love cherimoyas, great fruit. Um, I get them to pollinate at the at the uh, at the nursery by themselves. We don't wow. have to hand pollinate them. How do you do it? I, it just happens with wind, I guess. Um, in Phil, in Piru, where we're at, we get a constant onshore through the through the 126 from Ventura, yeah. and it constantly blows. I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, we prune the trees very hard every year. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Um, there's a grower in Carpinteria that I know doesn't hand pollinate his trees, a commercial grower, and he gets them to pollinate. Um, I know we're missing the pollinator, and I don't know how it happens. If you want to make sure you get fruit, you got to hand pollinate. Yeah. And that's that's a whole long process, but I've, I've had them produce fruit without hand pollinating. Um, bananas are fun to grow. Um, believe it or not, you can pretty much grow bananas here and, and get them to fruit. Um, How long it takes to get a fruit with banana? Probably, if, if it's in the right condition, I, my father-in-law lives in Cyprus, which is pretty close to the coast, and he had one that, that uh, produced fruit in three years. Big, long, beautiful f- um, flower, cut it off, had it hanging in the garage, and, and we actually <laughs> ate, the, ate the bananas off of it. It's fun. It's fun. It's a lot of, fun water it's fun a lot of water, a lot of mulch. A lot of water. A lot of mulch. They have a lot of trouble in high heat though, right? Yeah, you're going to have a little bit of an issue in the heat. So if you plant it where you get a little afternoon sun here in the valley, you'd be, you know, you'd be better off. Get that morning sun maybe up to noon and then a little bit of shade in the afternoon, you, you'd, do, you'd do better. You know, you got to remember, you got those little microclimates in your own yard. You own, you've got microclimates where you can adjust it. Yes, frost is an issue with bananas. Um, they'll grow back though for the most part. We don't get a hard enough frost to kill them. They'll die back. Do you provide the Chinese mulberry? We do not do a Chinese mulberry. I, um, I started growing mulberries. Um, we were doing a Pakistan and a weeping, weeping tea in a Pakistan. What's a good way to fertilize mulch trees? I worry about if I sprinkle the fertilizer on top of the mulch, it doesn't get down to the roots. It will. If you, use, if you use a pelletized, slow-release fertilizer and you throw it in your mulch, whenever it waters on top, it'll get down there. Eventually. Yep. Eventually it'll get down there. And it'll help break down the mulch, which is a good thing for the tree as well. Okay. Well, I've got drip irrigation too. So mm-hmm. it's, yeah. It doesn't really uh, then work. then you, you could get a um, inline fertilizer pump that you put the, the liquid right into the drip irrigation. Mm-hmm. That's always a possibility. Um, not super expensive to do, and then you just keep adding the powder to it, and then it drips into the into the tree. 
much like we do at the, at the nursery. Every time we water, we've got injectors that, that shoot a proprietary blend of fertilizer right into the water. So every time it waters, and we monitor, monitor that three or four times throughout the day to make sure the plants are getting the exact amount of fertilizer that we want them to. So yeah, it's, we've got big, huge, expensive pumps to do, you know, an eight inch line, but you're doing it in, in just regular drip line. You could, you could find a machine that does that. Um, other exotics, oh, uh, rare fruit growers know Edgar. What's Edgar's last name? Oh, yes. Edgar. Yeah, has um, his variety of dragon fruit, Edgar's Red or Edgar's Baby or whatever Edgar's calling it, um, has a um, uh, has contacted a um, tissue culture lab in Florida that we do business with, and I am eventually going to go exclusively to Edgar's Red. As you all know, Laverne Nursery only sells the three different varieties, white, red, and pink. We never got into the purple haze or the... Jimi Hendrix or all the different varieties that are out there. We just kept doing that, and Edgar's is one of them I'm sold on. I love it. We will be eventually, all of our reds will be Edgar reds. What uh, added to the soil to make that soil more acid? More acid. Um, I've heard people using pine needles. That'll raise your acidity up. You. Um, that's something that they do in the Midwest where they've got a lot of pine trees. I don't know if you can buy pine needles out here. You, in the Midwest, you can buy it in, the, in, in bags in, in the, like Home Depot or something. Um, I don't know if you can buy them out here. Other than that, when we grow in a container for blueberries, for instance, to, to change the acid, we use a, an acid fertilizer. It's like the Peters mix, the triple 20 Peters, where it's that, that powder and you mix in water. It's the same thing, but it's an acid base. You should be able to find that in any of your garden centers. I think it's 2199, but it's high in acid. Vinegar. Yes, I think it, I think that's the numbers, but it's it says acid enhanced right on the bag. What about coffee grounds? Coffee grounds should do it. Yeah, absolutely. Coffee grounds. You're you're doing your own compost. If you're doing that, you're doing bins with the worms. That'll raise it a little bit. Peat moss will absolutely help, but you got to be careful. In Southern California, we got clay soil, so you don't want to be mixing peat moss and heavy clay. What happens then? You're building a adobe house <laughs> because the, the the clay is going to bind with the peat moss, wow. and you're going to have this literally adobe that that starts forming in your soil. So you want to add some gypsum along with that, and the gypsum breaks down that clay. Then you can kind of start working your soil that way. Again, the best thing is to use your compost, get it in there and get it worked into the soil, get some more aeration, get that clay broken up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, sh that should get it, yep. That should raise it, but then on top of it, use that acidic liquid fertilizer. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how far that goes out. I, I would have to kind of take measurements on, on that and see how that works. That's why I like the pelletized slow reelers fertilizer. I can spread it all over and I know it's getting everywhere where I want it to get. The stakes, um, in my other life I worked at a landscape company and I swore by these pellets we'd throw in the bottom of the, um, the 24 inch box hole that we dug and we'd have to you know we'd sell those like crazy to the homeowners and it's similar to the tree stakes on the side i don't know how much that actually spreads out and how much is available in the tree but the pelletized stuff and you can you know where it's going and where it's going to sink in what else what else we got um, I'm looking forward to seeing as many people as we can to, to get up to, uh, to the nursery and, and take a look around. Um, it sounds kind of boring, but when you get up there, it's kind of cool. It's kept me for 20 years. So. <laughs> I just tried it for the first time. We got a Steve and we all, Jim was influential in getting us to do a tour and do a purchase. And normally we can't purchase from them, but they kind of helps us. And we're just trying to be the gold ticket of the Willie Wonka factory. Getting to see Willie show us crafting and, you know, first time he took his sharp knife and the most important thing, he shaped his arm and the whole place is went up. <laughs> it's, it's important. Amazing. It's amazing. 
if you got a knife in your hand and it came in handy this morning, if you can't shave the, the hair off your hand or your arm, then you need to sharpen your knife. That, and, and grafting, as we were talking about grafting earlier, you need to have a very, very sharp knife to graft. Otherwise, you're tearing all those cells in, in the cambium layer and it's not going to take. You need a very clean knife and you need a very sharp knife. Because you're only doing a couple here and there and you're not doing thousands like my guys are doing with, with a knife like this, I've even seen people use the X-Acto knife, brand new X-Acto knife or a scalpel, even that sharp. Very, very important to get a nice clean cut both on the rootstock and on the uh, cyan wood. Very important. And yeah, I can still shave with my, my knife. I know, I know for a fact I can. Yes? Um, I have a question about the cherries. Low yes. The Royal Crimson and the, and the, three, the two that came out first, they never bloomed at the same time on the horizon of the low chill area. Is that what you guys found too? Or, I mean, was, has anyone had a success with that? Yeah, that's a great Tom question, and, and I'm going to have to to uh, s tell you to send him an email and let him know okay, that, sorry. because I found the same thing. The Royal Lee and the Mini Mini Lee, Mini Royal. Now, from what I understand, they've come up with a new one that, that need to yeah. that needs to pollinate both of those. So, and oh, really? Yes. Okay. So yep. then, getting really uh, fine print on as long as it's in the ground in my yard. As long as it's not for profit. Okay. That's that's where that's where the patents start coming into into process. Tom Tom uh, Dave Wilson works very closely with Zyger, which is a great tour. If you guys ever get a chance to go through Zyger, it is incredible, amazing tour. Anyway, the old man Zyger is trying to protect his, his fruit of love, and he sells it to Dave Wilson, which protects the patent. And if Dave Wilson are, is to sell me Royal, Royal Lee and Mini Royal, or many of the other Zyger um, protected plants, I, as a propagator, can't take it and, yeah. and propagate it and turn around and sell them. I can propagate it for myself in my own house. Yes, absolutely. I've heard the question, uh, I was an editor, so I Mm -hmm. rights, but, um, does anybody graft, I'm not expecting the grafting, but graft for when the trees are, what, dioecious? I never really heard people talk about that. You know, like I tried to um, grow kiwi, that's why I A male, this. female together on the same plant, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, you, you can do that. Um, for, for, sure, yeah. For, in, for us in, at Laverne Nursery, we, we take the kiwi, we take a tamari and a Vincent and put them in the same container. No, I've never had a male bloom in, I've had six different males in the west side. Really? I mean, I could make all sorts of comments. But, yeah. You know, I actually went and got some male flowers, and I brought them to Myers and one of mine, and someone in the female was viable, but no male, I mean, I don't Interesting. Know. Yeah. I, I, that's the first time I've heard that. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Property, yeah. So but it, you, yes, I, I I I agree with him. When you have these multi-branched or multi-grafted trees, you could very easily have a, a cherry that needs both of them. Maybe a, a, a single stalk that has the mini royal and the royal lee on it, and and whatever the third I forget what the third one is. What I'm saying, if you put all three of those together, you'd have you'd have a cherry tree and, and hopefully get free, <laughs> fruit from all three. Yeah. Instead of having to buy each individual tree, or if one dies, or is it exactly. in a good spot? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like Lappin's cherries for this area. Does we learn nursery through passion, passion fruit? Passion fruit, absolutely. There's, I think there's two or three of them out there yeah, for the are. auction. Um, Frederick is a great one. Edgeless is a good one. I prefer the Frederick. It's a little bit bigger fruit. It seems to be more prolific. Okay, thank you. Very good, very good tree. Do I sell the kiwis? We do sell kiwis. Where we can find them? Um, we sell to all the independent garden centers, Green Thumb, Armstrong's, um, your, your neighborhood nursery. And we also go to into Lowe's, Home Depot, Costco. Yeah. Do you guys have finger line? We do have finger line. Okay, I've been looking for that. I right? love finger lines. They're I great. Um, if you've never seen a finger line, you cut open the little piece of fruit and you've got these little 
balls of deliciousness, uh, lime flavor. They do really nice on fruit or uh, fruit on the fish. A uh, nice piece of salmon, you grill it up and then you put this uh, finger lime on it. It's great. Where that can find the finger yeah, lime? I haven't... Finger lime, I... Finger lime typically is sold more through like Green Thumb or um, Armstrong's or some of those smaller garden centers rather than the big box stores. Big box stores tend to lean towards the big sellers, the Bears Limes, the Eurekas, the Haas Alicados, things like that. The more exotic stuff, you'll try the other, other nurseries. Do you have the red variety in there? No. I've heard people talking about the red variety, and I don't know that that is out there. I don't know who's producing it. It's an Australian film. I've been chasing it for, and this is no joke, I've been chasing it for 10 years. And the people in Australia don't want to give it out. Now, I've heard comments, and people have told me that there's red finger limes in the United States. I have not personally seen them yet. Yet. Be, be patient. Mm -hmm. Of which one? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what A nectarine. She should be self pollinating. Yeah, yeah, she should be okay. After two years, I had a lot of fruit, and then last year I didn't get any of How that's why I'm excited about this year because there's been there, there's been real spotty with with uh, deciduous trees up until this point, partly because of the drought, and partly because I like I said when when the rain hits and you got full of flower and it makes all the flowers drop off, you're not going to get any fruit unless they've already been been pollinated. So this year I think we're going to have a bumper crop, two thirds of your deciduous fruit, your little thumb just like that, flip them off, up and down the branch. It hasn't leafed out yet. I trim it right now. Yep. Get on it right now, just before, just before it, and you'll be surprised how much quicker it's gonna, it's gonna um, push the new leaves out. It's gonna come fast if you prune it right now. As a matter of fact, my bare root that I just planted from Dave Wilson in the nursery, we go through and we just, we call it nipping, just, just tipping everything and it wakes up all the buds that are left there and, and it starts flowering real fast. So if it hasn't started yet, go ahead and hit it. Even if it has a little bit, you're still okay. On what tree, what, on everything or just what? what Any deciduous tree, I wouldn't have a problem um, pruning right now. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. All right, thank you all. You can, you can kind of, you can fall either way on that. So like a pluot pollinating one with another is not GMO because you're it's a natural occurrence. Or you're saying it, I, it, yeah, it, it's one way. It, you're genetically modifying it because you're changing the genetics of one with the other, but you're not crossing families. You're not changing from one totally different organism to another different organism. I think that's that's the, the big issue. Um, what's next? Let's see. Yeah. If a disease is all over the county, yes. And if you suspect that maybe you may have it, yes. Uh, what can we do to say? How do we know we have it? Right. Yes or no? If you go, if you go on the um, California Department of Agriculture website, they will tell you who to get a hold of. You can also, there should also be a number that's called a hotline. If you believe you've got it, they would be more than happy to come running out to your house and take a look. Absolutely. Um, if, if the California Department of Agriculture doesn't do it, the USDA will do it. Either one of those. They both have hotlines to call for Asian citrus psyllid slash HLB. And they would, they'd be out in probably a day or two at the most. Be prepared, they may want you to remove your tree if, if they think you have it. <laughs> so when you when you get your citrus out here from your raffle, make sure you're not going past the seven basically the seven ten freeway. I will pull up a map if you think you're in that area and you shouldn't be taking citrus in there. So I'm off my soapbox about HLB and on being hemp. Yeah. Going back to the avocados, yeah. um, how successfully can you grow an avocado in a container? You, um, 
I, I'm, I'm from the Midwest, Midwest farm boy, and I've got uh, relatives that have, one of them's got a tangerine tree that he rolls in and out of his yard, and one's got an avocado in his living room. It's about, about this tall, and he grows it as a house plant. <laughs> never going to get fruit. Okay. He does get a little bit of flower here and there, but you're never really going to get fruit. Um, there's, uh, and Laverne sells, um, little, it's called Little Cotto, or Hybrid Dwarf. It's a shorter tree. Um, I've seen them that are 20 years old in, in a um, landscape scenario that are no more than 15 feet tall, small. These people never pruned it, never did anything. You can grow them in containers. You're not going to get the kind of fruit production you would think. You're not going to get the fruit production you would as if it were um, planted in, in the landscape. Mm -hmm. But you can do it. Yeah. Okay. There's other there's other trees that are suited for that. There's uh, genetically dwarf peaches and nectarines that you can keep small that would do great in like a whiskey barrel or something. So. Um, we'll talk about some of the new things. Um, I got a hawk. Uh, Laverne products while I'm up here a little bit. Um, some of the new stuff we're coming up with in avocados is um, I was down, anybody been to the UC Irvine field station? That's a great place to go down there, get a tour, talk to some of the people. There's a lot of knowledge down there. Um, I go down there. Um, Tom is a, is a regular, Tom Spellman is a regular down there as well. Um, a lot of good things going on. Anyway, I was down there and I've got a few different new avocados that Laverne is trying. Um, Jan Boyce is one of them that I'm super excited about. Anybody that's had a Jan Boyce probably won't go back to Haas. It's kind of, you, uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible piece of fruit. Um, I'm doing Kona Charwell with them. Um, the California root growers won't, won't know it as well, but it's called Aravipa. It's an Arizona um, uh, variety that, that they're real excited about. It's a native to this, this area, Aravipa, in Arizona. I'm trying that one for the, that market. And then the one that I just picked up that you're going to start seeing more and more of is called Gem. It's, uh, it's a real nice piece of fruit. It's very similar to a Haas. It's got a little bit thicker skin on it. And I would say maybe maybe even just a little bit creamier than a Haas avocado. So those are four new avocados that you'll start seeing. Um, it takes a, it takes a certain amount of time to get from I've got an idea I'm going to grow Jan Boyce avocados to the point where I can produce enough to get them out into the market. Um, on average, Laverne sells between 100 and 150 thousand avocados a year. So you can imagine I've got to have uh, a a huge source of cyan wood, and that's what it comes down to, is finding the cyan wood to, to keep um, producing these trees. So um, I'm, I'm estimating there will be some limited release of these three avocados probably in August of this year. So if you guys are interested in them. They are patent. I'm sorry? Does the Jan avocado have patents now? Jan Boyce? Yeah. I don't believe it does. Jem does. Jem does. Jem has one, and that's a, I believe it's a $2 um, uh, patent from the University of California. I had to go to a special nursery to buy it. I have two of them. Jem Boyce? Oh, my God. Jem. Jem. Oh, the gems. Yes. Yeah. The gem ab absolutely has it. You got to pay. And well, us as producers have to pay for it, so we try and pass it on to, to the employee. Uh, Could you name those again? Jem. J E or no G E M Jim, Jan Boyce as in the the woman's name Jan, B O Y C E, and then Kona Charwell. Kona Charwell's been around for a while. It's just something that I'm revisiting, and people seem to seem to be looking for it. Do they come as dwarf also, or I'm sorry. Like or they just Avocados are yeah. There there's no rootstock to my knowledge that you can grow to semi to dwarf an avocado. Oh. Um, I, <clears throat> Tony mentioned Tom cutting down trees and everybody getting excited about it. You can do the same thing with an avocado. As a matter of fact, because of the, um, the uh, heat wave that we had at the beginning of July this year, which burned most of, of the avocados, especially in Ventura County, um, what the growers have gone through and, and done is really thinned out the trees and really brought them back down to be manageable sizes because they had lost most of their fruit and most of the flower during that, during that time. Um, it was a great time for them to just go through. 
Otherwise, you got growers I, growers come to me and say, okay, when should I prune my, my avocado tree? So, well, you can do it pretty much any time you want, but you're going to be cutting off fruit or you're going to be cutting off flower. And, and obviously, when I'm, when I'm in a grove situation, I'm trying to produce as much as I can. They don't like doing it, so you see these trees get bigger and bigger and bigger year after year. But they took advantage of the heat that we had this year and really went through and pruned them pretty hard. How many years from the time that it's little, like from the nursery? Mm -hmm. so That's a great question. Um, you can expect fruit probably the third year. You'll start, and, and in a grove, they expect fruit three years after they plant it, and um, harvestable in about five. Because we're using wood that's already producing fruit, from the scion onto the seedling. Yeah, Mr. Burgess, uh, several months ago, mm -hmm. we gave us one from yours. Oh, okay. So that's why I'm, I'm curious, yep. because I do have it, it's about this big. Great, so it's about a year old now, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you, probably two years, you'll start seeing some flower on it, and then two years from then you'll you'll, you'll end up with some fruit. Yeah. Thank you. So if you get just avocados from the grocery store, can you plant those seeds and yeah. get good rootstock out of it? Or? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, so you, because we use, the only reason we use the Zutano is because it's cheap. Uh, um, Haas and Zutano is a pretty aggressive um, seed. It's a pretty big seed if you had a Zutano, and that's part of the reason we use it. There's a lot of energy, a lot of carbs in there, and it pushes it, pushes it up fast. You can use a Haas, you can use anything, yeah. Just grow them up, and like I said, we get ours about that size, half the, half the width of a pencil, and cut it off and cleft graft it, wrap it up with either paraffin. We, we at Laverne Nurse, we, we use a, uh, like a rubber band that's cut in half so it's open, and we just wrap it around there and tie it up. How long does it take to come up? To, 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 to knit in, to take. Uh, you can, you'll know in my grafter that's been doing it forever says 21 days. Mm -hmm. 21 days you go through and you touch, because you cut the leaves off, the, the um, cyan wood, right? And the, you've left a little bit of a petiole on there and the bud is right above there. Yeah. And if you go by in 21 days and you touch that petiole, it'll drop off, you know it knitted it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's taking, I don't want to touch it yet. Yeah, just, just, just do where it's, it's um, uh, where, the, where you put the graft in. Don't do the whole thing. So you got the petioles holding out there, and if you just touch those petioles, they'll drop off just like that. And then you know that what, what's happened is that bud is swollen up enough, and it's pushing that petiole off so it can, it can grow a, a new brand or a new leaf. 21 days. 21 days. 21 days. That's what he says. To the day. I'm like, does it matter in, in the morning or the afternoon? I mean, you know, so 25, 30 days. No, we cut the leaves off, but you leave the petiole, the, the, the stem of the leaf. Just yeah. the stem. Mm -hmm. When we're doing our onesie twosie grafting in our own backyard, is it worth parafilming the whole, the whole scion as well as the. You can, I don't think it's necessary with avocados. Now, we have a more heated environment than we do. Yes. So I have done it with avocados and I've done it with and without. Even outside, I've done it without and I've done it with. The big thing is to tree, tree, um, paint the, the cut on the top of the cyan wood so that doesn't dry out. That's the, that's the most important thing. The, the, um, the, for lack of a better word, the bark on the, on the um, cyan wood is enough to protect it, typically. But it wouldn't hurt. And then I bag mine. So in, in, a, in a landscape situation where it's outside and it's going to be in the sun, I, I go ahead and I take these white paper bags, you know, like for lunches or brown paper, and just wrap it around there. You'll see these in, in orchards sometimes. You'll see a whole bunch of these bags, and that's what it is. It's, it's the... Um, Sci it's the graft that they're covering up so it doesn't sunburn. And it produces a little bit of um, um, humidity. Yeah. One more question. Do they absorb one more and that's better, it. Uh, with morning sun, afternoon sun, or evening sun? Avocados year round, they were out in the middle of the high, hot sun. They love sun. Yep. Yep. One more question and a general question. Yeah. Uh, I know you mentioned a variety, but if you only had room on your property for three varieties, in your professional opinion, and I know the taste is um, what would be your top three favorite avocados? And then second question, um, maybe as a segue to other trees, Liver Nursery. I know avocados is one of your specialties, but there's other tropical trees that I was hoping you can share what the specialty is, is of Liver Nursery. Sure. Um, if I had three avocados that I was going to put in my yard, I, I'm going to have a big yard if I'm going to have three avocados. I, I would go 
and this is just personal preference. Remember, everybody's palate's a little bit different. I would go with a Jan Boys, I would go with a Gem, and I would go with a Bacon. The that's what? that's my way. Well, bacon. Bacon's a great piece of fruit. What was the first one? The Jan Boys, a Gem, and a and a Bacon. Can you get those now, the Jan Boys? Um, Laverne will have a very limited amount of them in uh, August or September. What, what, what places do you use like the Green Thumb in Ventura? We do. We sell the Green Thumb in Ventura. Great store, great people that run that there? place. I'm sorry? Can you get the gem there? Um, not at this point that I know of. I don't know if anybody else is producing it, but when I do release gem, it will be to the Independent Garden Centers first. It will be before the like them rather than a Home Depot or the Lowe's um, because they tend not to want to pay the the, the, um, the royalties on them. So it'll be to the garden centers, it'll be the Armstrongs, the Green Thumbs. The bacon, the, the bacon you can get just about anywhere. Um, the Jan Voice is going to be real limited, but the gem, I can see this exploding and, and taking off really fast. The, because what's happening is we've got groves that are producing it, you're going to start seeing the fruit in the stores real soon here along with um, Haas and some of the other avocados, you'll see a pretty mainstream, so people are going to be asking for it. Hi. What's the difference between Don't know that there is a difference. I think it's both the same, as far as I know. Yeah. I think. I, 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 now, it's a Hawaiian variety, so I'm not, I'm not totally familiar with it, but I believe they're the same. Kona or Charwell, he was wondering if there's a difference between Kona and Kona Charwell, or if they were the same. I believe they're the same. Pardon me, when's a good time for grafting? We have um, an existing seedling avocado. When's a good time for grafting? In the land, it's outside in your yard or in the landscape? No. I, 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 can, I would do that in what is this, March? I would do it in May. Okay. I would do it in May. You still have the ability to get good cyan wood, and it's going to be pushing at that time. I would do it in May. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. How often do you guys fertilize your avocado tree, and do you have any recommendations for fertilization? In the nursery, every time we water, we fertilize. That's why, they look, that's why nursery trees look the way they do. Every single time we water, we fertilize. Um, as, as a rule of thumb, you can fertilize every every quarter. You know that's easier to keep in your mind. I like a slow release fertilizer. Find one that is um, so we can get into fertilizers a little bit. Um, with with fertilizer, I like a slow release fertilizer because that way every time you water, you get a little little fertilizer. You never ever can burn a tree with. Slow, I've never burned a tree in 20 years with a with a slow release fertilizer. No matter how much you put on the tree. If you get a handful of regular fertilizer and you put on a tree, you put too much, you can burn the roots. Um, so I like the slow release. And when you start talking about fertilizers, you really need to look at the numbers. That I, I think everybody here knows it, but I'll, let me go through it. The first number is nitrogen. The second number is phosphorus. The third number is potassium. The nitrogen is for green growth. You want branches, you want stems, you want more leaves. That's what's going to produce that. The phosphorus is for flowers and, and for fruit. And the potassium is for roots, help the plant take up all these, all these nutrients. So if you've got a tree that is healthy, and let's say you got an avocado tree, it's uh, 15 feet tall, 15 feet wide, beautiful tree, you're getting a little bit of fruit every year. And you think, man, I should be getting more fruit. My first um, suggestion to that person is back off on the nitrogen, and raise the phosphorus. So now instead of a triple 20 that you were doing with your tree when it was this tall and you were trying to get it up and to be a nice tree and a nice landscape tree, now that you've got it up to that size, back off on the nitrogen. So now instead of a 10, 10, 10 or 20, 20, 20 that you were using, now go with a 5, 10, 10 or a 5, 15, 15. Raise that phosphorus and you're gonna get more fruit. The phosphorus is for the fruit and flower production. Speaking of flower production, are you guys excited? We're all going to have a bumper crop of deciduous fruit this year. We're going to have 
we're gonna have pears and apricots and plums and, and how many years have we gone without them because of the damn drought or because of, <laughs> we'd get the rain when the flowers in full and then the rain would come and make all the flowers fall off it's just been a mess for the last few years you're gonna have a lot of fruit this year get out and thin your fruit thin the fruit off I know it kills you to go through and pull off up to two-thirds of your fruit off from your tree two-thirds if you don't take it off you're gonna have these you're gonna come in and say Daniel I've got this plum it's about this big around I get it in my mouth and I eh, it's done I, I don't know what to do I, why don't I have what I said did you take off two-thirds of your fruit no no I would never do that I don't want to lose my fruit oh my god no I you tell I want more. my baby but, you're going to end up with fruit this big. You'll end up with apricots that big. So you've got to thin your fruit up to two thirds. Don't be scared. Remember Tom cutting that tree down. Everybody gets a nice big tree after that, right? It's a lot of fruit to cut. Yes. From an avocado seed. Yeah. So when again when when we when we do ours, we we get them out. We clean them, we put a little bit of um, uh, fungicide on them to keep them from, from rotting in the system, and we use a, a, very, a mix of perlite and um, uh, peat moss. More perlite than peat moss, because we don't want that seed to rot. We don't want it getting too wet, staying real wet. Um, just keep it watered, keep it warm, keep it uh, humid. We, we, um, we warm the bottom of it, we keep the root zone at about 70 degrees as, as we're germinating avocados. We keep them moist, but not soaking wet because of the perlite. A little bit of um, um, peat moss will keep them moist enough. We water them every other day, and we heat them to 70 degrees. Can you mention something about cutting off the top Yeah, so the, the, um, the avocado seed's got a little nipple or the tip of it. And if you just shave the tip of that off, or down an eighth to a quarter inch, just shave that off, and then plant it. You'll um, and then plant it about this much deeper. You know, you don't go very deep with it. You don't, you don't, don't go, don't go that deep with an avocado. It's probably an inch of soil on top of it, and it'll take off. It'll come out. Lots of perlite, a little bit of peat moss. Now you know what to do. Now you know what you've been doing wrong. Right? <laughs> <laughs> is there is there better? Um, better seeds than others that will produce better I mean yeah I um, so Brokaw uses a seed out of Florida and I think we were talking about the variety earlier somebody was I was talking about it's a seed that's about this big and I don't know the variety of it and they use that because they use it over and over and over because they're grafting it several times with a that inner stock with that root rot resistant mm -hmm. we use Zutano um, I have access to Zutano. It's, uh, it's a pretty fast growing seed. It's pretty aggressive seed. That's why I like it. If I didn't have access to Zutano, I've used bacon in the past. It's still a big seed and I will use that as well. And Haas is that? Haas is a smaller seed. It doesn't have the carbohydrates to push the, the, okay. um, the, the initial stalk out real fast like a Zutano or a yeah, I mean, I've even used Forte. I don't necessarily like to use Forte, but I'll use bacon and, and Zutano. Mm -hmm. Where is the nursery and if we can visit? The nursery is in, um, the name of the nursery is Laverne. It's no longer in Laverne, San Dimas area. We're up in Piru, which is in Ventura. Mm -hmm. I know, where the hell is Piru? I just heard you say mm -hmm. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Ventura County. We're halfway between um, Ventura and Magic Mountain, basically, on the 126. Um, we, the California Rare Fruit, we are not open to the public, but the California Rare Fruit Growers usually puts together a tour and probably do something later in the summer this year. Uh, are you more, Fillmore? Yes, we're, we're on this side of Fillmore. Oh, okay. Yeah. They have some more. Yes, the, that, and that whole valley is full of them. As a matter of fact, in the beginning of July, I, I think it was the third, second or the third, I was standing in a grove working with a, with a grower and the heat just came on. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon and it literally 100, I, I kid you not, this is no exaggeration, it was 120 degrees. And I was standing there and you could hear the, this sound, it sounded like it was hailing and it was the trees dropping the fruit. It was that bad, just, I, and I was, I was worried about getting hit. That's how much this fruit was dropping in the, in the orchards. I have two questions about kumquats. We planted six kumquats 
as ornamental trees mm -hmm. in in uh, concrete containers that okay. are probably about four or five feet deep, and they're prolific producers. Yeah, prolific. In fact, we brought some jam that we made. Great. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but we we had two questions. One is in the last two years the leaves have turned yellow. It's still producing, but the leaves are very yellow. They don't look as healthy as they used to. And secondly, how much can we prune them down? Because they're getting very big. Mm -hmm. How long have they been in there? Six years. Um, <coughs> are there drain holes at the bottom? Yes. Okay. So <coughs> what can happen is that soil gets used up, gets old. You've taken all the nutrients out of it. So if you're not fertilizing on a regular basis, you need to start that. Slow release fertilizer every time you water. What number? Yeah, something like that. If you did a triple 10, should be okay. It should be good because you, you're looking to get more green. You can take a citrus tree and you can cut it down as far as you want. Okay. Just don't go below the ground. You can bring that back as tight as you want. Um, I would suggest using a little tree paint. If you're going to do it and it's not going to have a canopy on it, I would go through and, and use the tree paint that Charles sells or that uh, there are other, other tree paints out there. I would use it and I would dilute it quite a bit so you don't have to look at the white stalk right. necessarily because now you you're obviously have them growing for aesthetic reasons. So you can cut it way back to prevent from the, the sunburn. Um, yeah, don't be scared to cut citrus. Any, any, any size citrus, in, in pots, in, in landscapes, don't be scared to cut your citrus tree. Keep it, keep it pickable. You know, you know, you only want to share with so many critters out there. Get up there <laughs> and, and keep your fruit for yourself, right? Right. Where do you throw citrus scrap uh, cuttings? Do you put it in the compost or do you put it in the green? Or, or um, the, the trees themselves you can compost. The fruit, I don't think that I, I'm not a, oh, my, my compost person just left. I'm, I don't think that citrus does well in compost. I think it's too acidic. Okay. 